Blues and trouble, that's the cliche. The reality is blues and chaos. Blues is supposed to be what? Nurtured by trouble? So is most art that reaches deep inside and demands unflinching honesty. Is blues about trouble? No more than it is about good times Saturday nights and murder most foul, sharecropper servitude in sweet home Chicago. Is blues a cause of trouble? Not directly. But what sort of thing almost inevitably causes trouble in our oppressively regimented world? You guessed it, chaos. The blues and chaos equation first presented itself to me in the mid-60s, when a bunch of us, musicians, artists, and a smattering of smugglers and dealers organized and presented the first Memphis Blues Festival in the Overton Park Shell. For years, I believe the remarkable levels of chaos and everything remotely connected with those festivals resulted from a bunch of hippies trying to turn elderly blues singers into anarchist father figures. <laughs> now I'm not so sure. In any case, that was before I met R.L. Burnside. R.L. was an outstanding disciple of one of the greatest of all bluesmen, Mississippi Fred McDowell, who had been at Memphis Blues Festival regular. By the early 1970s, R.L. had really come into his own. The gin joints he ran in the North Mississippi Hill Country were as famous for their level of violence as for R.L.'s outstanding music, which rolled out of his jacked up guitar <coughs> amp in dark, turbulent waves, sometimes punctuated by gunshots, especially on Saturday nights. In fact, R.L. has been reported waving a presumably loaded pistol in at least one crowded joint. If that strikes you as akin to yelling fire in a crowded theater, well, that's R.L. The man is a connoisseur of chaos. He attracts it, admires it, and then absorbs it like a black hole, sucking reality itself into the chaos of nothing. Back in 1993, when I found myself producing a Burnside session for the album Too Bad Jim, a succession of chaotic eruptions seemed to threaten the entire project. A string bass fell to pieces in the studio, then the drum kit collapsed in the kindling after being given a single light tap. A glass door fell out of its mounting and gave me a skull-rattling knock upside the head. Out of the corner of my eye, I glanced over at R.L. He was enjoying himself like a kid at a Disney movie. The performances he recorded that day were highlights of the album. I decided out of near desperation to fight fire with fire. Using objects and materials you can find in any good botanica and dedicating them with a simple made up ritual I thought appropriate, I made myself a chaos buster, a post Heisenberg uncertainty principle mojo hand. The next time I went into the studio with RL, the mojo was secreted on my person. The session went well. Toward the end, we were taking a break when it happened again. A tall screen began to tip over, as usual for no apparent reason. It fell and hit engineer Robbie Norris on his head. This time, I was all smiles. It worked, I crowed, giving my mojo charm a surreptitious rub. Robbie was gingerly rubbing the top of his head. Yeah, he said, it works for you. But of course, that's just what you expect from magic. If it affects the practitioners of reality and in the way desired, it works. <coughs> Chaos theory is one way of explaining the mechanics involved. Another more, pro more poetic and perhaps wiser way of explaining it is called the blues. Rarely have chaos and uncertainty been so listenable, and I'll almost certainly be listening for the rest of my life. If I choose to pack my mojo, well, once again the blues says it the best. Ain't nobody's business if I do.